Amen. All right, tonight we're in Genesis chapter number 49. We have two weeks left, of course, of the Bible study. There's 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. I want to begin this evening with giving you the context and reminding you, and I had mentioned this last week, uh, the continuity of Genesis chapter 48 and Genesis chapter number 49. Now, Genesis chapter 48 begins really a continuity and a context that ends at the book of, at the end of the book of Genesis, the very end of Genesis chapter 50, very last verse. It, it ends up, uh, you know, concluding basically this whole story that begins here in Genesis 48, verse 1. Now, as we saw last week, look back at Genesis 48, verse number 1. It says this, And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So notice that a messenger came unto Joseph and let him know, Hey, your father is sick. Joseph goes to him and he brings his two sons with him, Manasseh and Ephraim. Well, in this chapter, chapter number 48, we saw the blessings of Joseph through Manasseh and Ephraim. So he gives those blessings to Manasseh and Ephraim. And these are also the blessings of Joseph. We're told that there at the end of Genesis chapter number 48. Now, here in Genesis 49, it's a continuity of that. So he just got done. He just finished blessing Ephraim and Manasseh. And then it tells you in Genesis 49, verse number 1, And Jacob called unto his sons and said... So right now, this chapter is about him blessing just his 12 sons in general. And he also speaks about Joseph at this time as well. And we're actually given a summary of what this chapter is about. If you look at verse number 28, it says this... All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is it that their father spake unto them, and blessed them. Every one according to his blessing, he blessed them. So what that is, is that's a summary of what was taking place in this chapter. And also we get, we're given a hint about these blessings. Notice that it says in the beginning of verse number 28, all these are the twelve tribes of Israel. So these blessings that we're going to be reading about, there are multiple applications, but one of them for sure is about the tribe. It's not just about the individual. That's one thing also I want you to keep in your mind while we go through here. There are multiple applications to what we're about to look at. There are immediate applications. The blessings that are given to each individual, we are going to see things from and, from and to that individual. We're also going to see things that are, of course, uh, sometimes figures of Christ. But then as we just read in verse number 28, we're going to see the blessings and prophecies that will come forth in the, in the future on the entire tribe. So... Uh, the end of Genesis 48, one other thing about the last chapter, we, I mentioned how this was Jacob. At the very end of last week, I mentioned how Jacob was prophesying. And how this was not just Jacob just you know, uh, giving just a, 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 you know, a blessing, right? Or, or showing his favoritism upon Manasseh and Ephraim. That this was a blessing from God and that he was actually prophesying. And I showed how one thing that he, that he says to Ephraim and Manasseh is actually him predicting the future. Showing even further that he is prophesying. And a lot of what we're going to be reading in Genesis 49 is going to be predictions of the future. Oftentimes that's how uh, the word prophecy is going to be mentioned. Uh, I want you to look at verse number 1. We're going to see that here in verse number 1. It says this, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Now, just an overview of that verse alone. Does it sound like that, that the primary application is going to be to the individual? Or is it going to be to, as, is, as it says in verse 28, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? That makes perfect sense, right? The 12 tribes. Well, let's start off by defining the word, the last days. Now, this is real important because a lot of people have different definitions of this. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 1. Most people when they hear last days, they just automatically go to end times, like right at the very end, where we're talking about the tribulation, you know, the wrath of God, right? But the, the, the word last days is not always referring to that. It is used oftentimes referring to the very end, right? 
but not always. And I'm going to show you and tell you what I believe the looser definition of last days is. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 1. Here we're going to see it used as the end times, how we would use it uh, when we're speaking about like, uh, you know, the, the end of the world, if you will. Look at verse number 1. It says this, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, if you study the Bible, of course, that's talking about the end times. You can cross-reference this you know, with a few different places. And he is speaking about, you know, right before the tribulation, right? When people are going to be without natural affection, the world just becomes wicked again, just like in the days of Noah, and then God pours out his wrath, right? So you can see that it is used sometimes as referring to you know, the end of the world, as it says in, uh, you know, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus Christ words it that way. Was the last days, when it's used right here, last days, referring to, this is very important, referring to the time when Timothy was alive right then? Because notice how that's worded. That's future tense. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So is he talking about present tense when he writes to Timothy, or is this something that's going to come in the future? In the future. So you can see how it's being used, like I said, as the end of the world, okay? I want you to go to two other places. Uh, Acts 2.17. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 17. We'll look at that first. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 17. It says this, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So, what time period did he say that he was going to do this? In what? The last days. And when did he do it? Right then, right? This is being fulfilled in Acts chapter number 2. So when last days is used here, what, in what time period is it talking about? Right then, right at that period of time. So do you see how it can, you know, it's not a very specific term. I want you to go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. Whoops. Hebrews chapter number 1. Look at it here. And then I'll elaborate more on its different uses, the, word, the words or the phrase last days. So it says in verse number 1, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, it says this in verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So notice how when Paul writes this, he says, hath in these last days, excuse me, spoken unto us, by his son. So the word last days does not it does not refer to a very specific, you know, uh, or a precise time period. It can be used in one of two ways. Number one, yes, it can be used in the last days where it's speaking about the time period of the tribulation, God's wrath. You can you can actually demonstrate that a few different ways. But not only is it used in that way, last days also refers to anything, I believe, after the time of Christ. I believe after the time of Christ, when Christ came and once that was fulfilled, right around that time period that began, and all the way on until, you know, if you will, the end of the world. So what you would have is the, the term sometimes last days referring to, you know, basically around the time when the new covenant was implemented until you know God's wrath begins but obviously if you divide that time period up and you say hey this is the last days there's gonna also be a, a, a time period that is the last days of the last days it's redundant but I'm sure everybody understands what I'm saying and that's what's being referred to there so you can see but you can demonstrate very clearly from Acts 2 and Hebrews 1 that the time period after Christ to the end of the world is last days that's very clear but then also Paul writes and refers to the time to come of perilous times, trouble, right? And he says, hey, in the last days, you know, perilous times shall come. So that makes perfect sense. Go back to uh, uh, Genesis chapter number 49. Genesis chapter number 49. And I'm gonna, uh, I want to elaborate on this a little bit further because this is important. Because uh, here, th when people refer to what this is referring to, the last days, there are applications about... The, the 12 tribes of Israel that apply to where they were geographically located. There are multiple applications. But I also want to say this. Last days is also referring to end times here because there are prophecies within this particular chapter that actually occur in the last days. I want you to look at, we're going to go back to this and get a little bit further into it, but I believe everyone's familiar enough with this to where it'll make... Uh, 
you know, uh, plenty of sense. Look at verse number 11. Binding his foal unto the vine. This is Judah, and it's prophetic of Jesus. And his ass is cold under the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth, teeth white with milk. Now what time period does that take place in? That takes place in, in, in Christ's you know, uh, uh, second advent, doesn't it? So that is the last days of the last days, right? A lot of people will try to twist what's being said here when it says last days because... A lot of people will say this, and I'm going to further prove that this is, <clears throat> that this is not true. A lot of people say this, well, none of, the, none of the tribes of Israel, you know, exist anymore. They're totally gone, and they'll reference, you know, the encyclopedia, and they'll say that they're all mixed and mingled, and none of them exist today, right? I want you to go to the book of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Deuteronomy. I want you to look with me at Deuteronomy Chapter number 31, I believe. 31, verse number 28. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes. This is Moses when they're being brought out of the land of Egypt. This is uh, you know, somewhat similar to what we saw before when Jacob gathers them. It says, uh, uh, And your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. And it says this, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. And it says, and Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Now the purpose of this song is to testify against who? Israel. When is this song sang? The latter days. In the book of Revelation, right where we see you know, the, the fulfillment of Jesus Christ with his robe being dipped in, uh, his garment being dipped in blood. Is that a coincidence? You look in uh, uh, 31, it says that it's meant, the time that, or the purpose that it is, is to testify against Israel. It's saying in the latter days. Uh, not only that, when you read throughout the book of, of uh, Deuteronomy in chapter number 32, it's talking about them going after other gods, rejecting him, talking about how his wrath is being poured out on them. And what do you have taking place in the book of Revelation? You have, of course, the appearance of, you know, the great whore. And as everyone here, uh, you know, believes and is informed, who is the great whore? It is Jerusalem. So to say that they do not exist is ridiculous. And that's what some people will teach. But here you have a prophecy that is, that is fulfilled in the book of Revelation in the latter days on the people of Israel. And people try to say, oh, well, Israel exists in, in, in no way. All the tribes are completely scattered. There are still prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled upon Israel. So to say that they don't exist in any way, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. Go back to Genesis chapter number 49. So are some of these prophecies the last days of the last days? That's my point. Yes, they are. We can prove that by looking at the prophecies of Judah and the prophecies that are fulfilled through Christ in the last days of the last days. So that's very important there. And like I said, there are going to be multiple applications. We're going to see applications to the person. We're going to see applications to the tribe and then some you know, through Christ as well. Look at verse number uh, 2. It says this, Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. He begins, verse number 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Now, does that sound like positive or negative? Sounds like a lot of positive, doesn't it? Sounds like a lot of positive being given to him. And it's, and it's with, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, great swelling words, if you will. I mean, he tells him, he says, you are, he says, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. That is extremely positive, isn't it? So he begins this, very positively. But look at verse number four. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Now is that positive or negative? That's negative, isn't it? So notice how he names off, what is it, four things? My might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Four very, very positive things. But then he concludes it with one negative thing, and it's unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. A very simple statement. 
And what I believe that you can learn from this is the importance of stability. Think about that, the significance of stability. Because he has all these other great qualities. He has the strength, he's his might, the excellency of dignity, uh, you know, the excellency of his power. I mean, a lot of positives, but you know what he doesn't have? He doesn't have, you know, consistency. He doesn't have discipline. He's unstable. And it says, as water, and then he says, thou shalt not excel, right? What does it mean to excel? It means to like succeed. So he's saying if you're, if you're not stable, you're not going to succeed. Even if you have a lot of good qualities in your life, even if you have a lot of good virtues, but you're not stable, if you're just like this, you're not going to excel. Look at what it says next. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. So you see bed and couch being used interchangeable. Oftentimes couches will just be used alone. So make sure that you remember that in your Bible reading. But notice what it says there. Thou wentest up to thy father's bed. What's it talking about? If you remember, you know, we read about this where, where Reuben went in unto his, uh, unto his handmaiden, if you will, became his wife, his concubine, who was Bilhah. You know, he went in unto Bilhah and he, of course, you know, had a, a, a uh, you know, immoral relationship with her, went in unto his father's bed and said, Then defilest thou it. And it says, He went up to my couch. So notice how this one sin is what's referenced when he says that he's unstable. And this alone caused him to be to not be able to excel. I want you to notice that. Just this one major sin. And, you know, I referenced this, uh, you know, a, a few weeks ago. I think actually when I talked about this particular story and a couple of other stories uh, in the book of Genesis, I think I referenced it more than once. You know, like what happened with Donnie Romero. You know, that's all you remember about people like that. It's sad. That's all, that's, you know, when, when things like that occur, when you think of a ministry, when you think of a person, they may do a lot of great things. They may, you know, have a lot of great things that they do in their lives, but you know what you're going to remember? That one big blotch on their record. You know, that one big, that, that, that major sin. I mean, what he committed here was obviously horrible. It was extremely wicked. Even though he had done a lot of great things, even though he had had a lot of great qualities, this one huge blotch on his record was able to make him to not be able to excel. That shows how wicked fornication is, by the way. You know, fornication is so wicked that the Bible says that if you're living in fornication, God doesn't want you attending in his congregation. That you're to be kicked out of the church. I mean, that shows how wicked fornication is. That the firstborn lost, completely lost, his blessing here. Now, a lot of these, notice it said that, that this is the blessings of the 12 tribes. They're not all completely positive. They're going to, you know, they're, they're partially positive because things are being handed down. So there's still blessings, of course. The Bible refers to them as that. But there's a lot of blessings that are being withholden from the 12 tribes because of the actions of the 12 patriarchs. Think about that. Let that set in while we go through here. I want to make that point, and then we're going to start speeding up right now. Everything that is going to befall their ancestors are based on things that these men did in their lives. Think about that. Millions of people that came after them, everything you know, that, that, that comes upon them and that's prophesied about them from this chapter happens because of a result of how those 12 men lived in their lives. So think about that in your life and think about how you're affecting your offspring and your children by the way that you live in your life. And the blessings that God could give and may withhold because of maybe some wickedness that you have in your life. Maybe some sin, maybe something that you don't have straight in your life. You know, that will cause blessings to not be passed down or blessings to be, blessings to be withholding from, you know, your offspring. So think about that, how this is, these are all related to these persons, each individual. And there's more than three of them, all right? No, I'm just kidding. Look at verse 5. It says this. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor. Be not thou, be not thou united, for in their anger... They slew a man, and in their self-will, they dig down a wall. Now, of course, this is referring to how they, they slew uh, uh, Shechem, who was the son of Hamor. When Dinah you know, went out to see the daughters of the land, and she ended up committing fornication with Shechem, you know, they ended up saying you know, that, that, they, that he dealt with 
you know, their sister as, as you would with a harlot. So they went in and they killed Shechem, which they shouldn't have done that. This, this chapter actually shows that they shouldn't have killed, even from God's perspective, they shouldn't have killed him. And God didn't, get, didn't prescribe the death penalty for fornication in the first place. That's why that says this here. But they went in and not only did they kill him, and he didn't deserve to die because of that, they killed everyone in the entire city. Every person. And then they took all of their goods and all of their possessions. Possessions. They, they murdered everyone and then stole all of that. I mean, you can see a lot of the strong language here. Cruelty, cruel, wrath, fierce. Just you know, a lot of really strong words here about how wicked this was. You know, obviously, uh, one of the things about it, verse number 6, notice it says at the end, it says, and in their self-will, they dig down a wall. Notice how this was their own self-will. You know, this was something that they dreamt up. This was not right. They should not have been doing it. That's what it's saying. And then he says, mine honor, be not thou United. He, so Jacob is saying he doesn't want any part of this. Remember when it happens, he says that under the Perizzites and the Canaanites, he's gonna, they're going to make him stink, right? That, that he's going to have a bad reputation because of them. He's saying he doesn't want his honor to be united with them and, and them to make him look bad, right? He's saying, that's why he says, O my soul, come not thou into their secret unto their assembly. Right? It talks about sometimes the assembly of the wicked in the Bible. It's talking about them assembling and gathering together and devising to do bad things. So they came together, obviously, one time, Simeon and Levi, and they you know, devised this plan that they were going to go do this. Right, And then it says that, uh, it says, For in their anger they slew a man, and, and in their self-will they digged down a wall. Verse 7, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce. And their wrath, for it was cruel. Notice he said, cursed be it. So this whole chapter isn't just blessings either. You know, we're seeing him cursing things as well. He says this, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And what's interesting about that statement is the Bible's language is so precise. Notice in the previous chapter, it talks about their assembly. And he says, mine honor, be, that, be not thou united. And then, while he's talking about Simeon and Levi, what is their punishment? He says, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Why? Because they came together. They devised this plan. He's saying, hey, I don't want you guys together. So that's the whole reason why they're not, they're scattered throughout the land. Now, in, uh, um, this applies in a couple of different ways. Number one, Simeon, the tribe of Simeon, did not receive you know, an inheritance. I believe I, go to Joshua 19. I did. I wrote it down here. Joshua chapter number 19. They, did, they received an inheritance, but they didn't receive their own plot of land or their own lot of inheritance. Look at Joshua chapter number 19. Look at verse number 1. And the second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families and their inheritance. Watch this. And their inheritance was within the inheritance of the children of Judah. So notice how their inheritance is like inside of the inheritance of the children of Judah. You know, no one else is, is like this, but Levi kind of in a way. So their inheritance, they don't like have their own land, like, hey, this is all our own land. They're just like mixed and mingled in the inheritance of Judah, of those that are of the tribe of Judah. Uh, go to, now I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 18. We'll see that Levi was very similar. The tribe of Levi, Levi was very similar. We'll see how these prophecies are fulfilled. <clears throat> Levi, of course, you know, they ended up being the priests. And because of that, they were scattered throughout in you know, uh, the land of Canaan. They were scattered all throughout there. And uh, you know, there would be cities, and they were, they were to be given a city. And right outside of that, they were to have suburbs and things like that. And they were all throughout the land of Canaan. They weren't in one particular spot. They were scattered all throughout the land of Canaan. Look at uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse number 1. It says, The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Now notice that there is no specific land again that's given to them, specifically to Levi. They are you know, assigned little plots of land that are outside of 
Right, and this is where the cities of refuge are, there are all the different cities of refuge. These little plots of land are scattered all throughout the land of Canaan. It's not one, you know, assembled, you know, congruent area, right? It's not just one big chunk of land, they're scattered everywhere. And this was as a result, as a consequence, if you will, because it's, it's meant to be negative because of what Simeon and Levi had done. So this, this actually happened to their, you know, their, their uh, uh, you know, um, uh, ancestors as a result of what they did in their lives personally. So you can see how, you know, you affect your, your offspring very strongly. Look at verse number 8 now. This is the very first, you know, fully positive, you know, fully, uh, uh, full blessing. Uh, verse number 8, it says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now there are multiple applications to this, like I had mentioned uh, you know, earlier on in the sermon. One of the applications, of course, is the rulership that is given to the tribe of Judah. Now if you remember, the very first king was Saul, who was you know, the son of Kish, who was of the tribe of Benjamin, not of Judah. David stepped in after that, and then from then, you know, all the way, you know, Zerubbabel and on, that was the line of Judah that was reigning. And it was an unbroken line that just continuously, you know, reigned throughout that. So you see in verse number 10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. So you see that prophecy about how Judah is going to be the one that is reigning, right? The lawgiver from between his feet. The scepter, what is a scepter? A scepter is you know, like a rod that a king holds, right? Uh, you know, that is what a scepter is. So it's referring to the rulership again. That's why in verse number 8 it begins with, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. And then it says this, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. I want you to turn to Psalm chapter number 18. Psalm chapter number 18. <clears throat> book of Psalms, and we're going to go to Psalm chapter number 18. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 18, verse number 40. It says this, Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. So notice what David said. He says, Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies. Right? And then we look here in verse number 8, and it says, it says, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemy. So we can see a clear application that's given to David, right? Because he is of the line of Judah, and David being such a strong picture of Christ as well. It goes on to say, thy father's children shall bow down before, before thee, right? You know, this obviously, and the first statement in verse number 8 as well, is of course referring to Christ. Referring to the brethren praising him, right? Referring to his brethren or the father's children bowing down before him. It is referencing Jesus Christ who came of the line of Judah. That's why when we get to verse number 9, it says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion. Couch would be like crouched. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now, what is the, one of the statements that we refer to uh, Jesus Christ as? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's not a coincidence. That's actually coming from here in verse number 8. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion that would come out of Judah, right? The ruler of Judah. That is, all, that is always a reference, what you're reading to here in verse number 9 when we read that. Look at verse number 10 now. Again, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter number 28, verse number 57. Deuteronomy chapter number 28, verse number 57. We're turning a lot tonight, so I'm trying to hurry up through here so we can get through the whole chapter. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter number 28, verse number 57. 
It says this, And toward her young one that cometh out, and then notice this, from between her feet. So notice that the phrase there, between her feet, is referring to her offspring. I've heard people try to contest this before, what this is referring to here specifically in Genesis chapter number 49, when it says, a lawgiver from between his feet. It's obviously referring to the fact that that is where your seed lies, if you will, right? And it's saying that of his seed, there will not depart a lawgiver or someone reigning in that line. Of course, there became a monarchy and it was, you know, it was hereditary where it was passed down from you know, uh, one person to the next, to a son, to his son, and to his son. That's what that's referring to when it says from between his feet. And then it makes the statement, until Shiloh come. Now, I've heard a lot of, you know, of, of theories on this. I've heard at least three that I could think of. I'm not fully settled on my theory, but I'll tell you what I think that it possibly is. Now, Shiloh only comes up about one thing really distinctively. Only one thing. The tabernacle rested in Shiloh at the time of Joshua. When they got into Canaan, at the time of Joshua, they put the tabernacle in Shiloh, and it stayed there all the way until the time of Samuel. All the way until that time of, of uh, Eli and Samuel, right? So that was the, you know, the, the, where the tabernacle actually rested during that time. Of course, later on, you know, the temple was built and basically replaced, if you will, the tabernacle. Now, I'm looking for, you know, because this, everything about Judah is very, very figurative. So there, there, there probably is a, a you know, a, a more immediate physical application that I have no clue about. But I'll tell you what I believe the spiritual application is. Now, what is a tabernacle in the Bible referred to many times? It refers to the body over and over again, right? What is, notice that it says a lawgiver and it says from between his feet. Notice how that's referring to a physical offspring. And then it says until Shiloh come, right? So what I would say that this is talking about is this. Number one, let's just ask this question first. Let me you know, kind of back up a tiny bit. Let's say this. When does the lawgiver, when does, when, just in history, in the history of the Bible and secular history, when did the last king reign? Who was the last person of that line? When did it end? Where? Matthew chapter number one with who? The Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that that ha has a reference to until Shiloh come. That's where that line was cut off. There's no, they don't have a king today. You know, that's when it was done. Until Shiloh comes. So there was, but notice that the reference begin with, that it's, it begins with, it's not going to, you know, a lawgiver's not going to, to cease or to end, you know, from between his feet. And it says, until Shiloh come. So there's a reference to the physical offspring until Shiloh comes. And Shiloh is a reference to where, when you look it up always, where the, the tabernacle lie. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he even refers to his own body as the temple. Peter refers to it as the tabernacle. His own body as the tabernacle. It's common in the Bible that the physical body will be referred to as a tabernacle, as a temple. And it talks about how you know, God dwells among us and how he is in that tabernacle, right? In the book of Ezekiel. Now, I didn't look that particular passage up. Uh, but, you know... This is, a, this is common language that will be used. So a spiritual application here could be until Shiloh come, referring to when the tabernacle was dwelling there among them. It could be speaking about when the Lord Jesus Christ dwelled in His tabernacle, the fleshly body. God actually came in the flesh, you know, and that's Shiloh coming. And, that, and then if you look at the next verse, it says this, And unto Him shall the gathering of the people be. Now that again is another clear reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And when is the gathering of the people to Him? You, the rapture is the most clear thing that I think of. There are other ways that it talks about us being gathered together, right? You know, it talks about uh, uh, in the book of Ephesians how we're gathered together in one, those that are in heaven and those that are on earth, that He might gather them together in one. You know, so there's a spiritual application there. But unto Him shall the gathering of the people be. That, to me, is a very clear reference to, you know, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. So the Shiloh coming is without a doubt it's pointing to Jesus because that's when that line you know ended. Either way, you know, if you you know if you study it out and and you come up with something, you know, that's the best that I've had. I've had other people, I've talked about it with other people. It has something to do with the Lord Jesus Christ when he came. And Shiloh, the only thing in the Bible that, it, that you can ever really pinpoint it down and it talks about a lot is the tabernacle. So that makes the most sense to me. Look at verse number 11. It says, Binding his foal unto the vine, 
and his ass's colt under the choice vine. It says this, He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Go to Revelation chapter number 19. I alluded to this and we'll go ahead and look this up. Revelation chapter number 19. The pro this is actually prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ when He comes back of the, the Lion of the tribe of Judah as He is referred to. Verse number 11 it says, And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Notice how it's referring to his judgment. The scepter was mentioned there, right? In Genesis 49, verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire. Now notice when we read there in Genesis 49, verse number 12, it said, His eyes shall be red with wine, right? So keep reading, verse number 12, it says, uh, And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So notice there that we see the fulfillment, the clear fulfillment, uh, the man of the, of, who is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, who came of the line of Judah, comes back and his garments are, he had, it's referred to as a vesture here, it says, dipped in blood. Genesis 49 told us, it says this, He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now I want you to go to um, Isaiah chapter number 63 now. Isaiah chapter number 63. Now ever since I made that video about the black Hebrew Israelites, there have been tons, obviously there's tons of black Hebrew Israelites commenting on the video, but there's also a ton of like Nazis and like they, these people that are like, that are like, they, you know, they're just, just like how the black Hebrew Israelites, they just say Jesus is black because they're racist. Well, these are people that say that Jesus is white. And they mean like white European, like Scotland, Ireland, like that type of white. One of the things that I see these types of people commenting, I'm even receiving emails. I got like three of them from some guy today. And he's like saying that he's an Aryan and I'm of the true try, you know, true blood, Aryan blood, and that's where Jesus is from. It, and, it, and they almost even look like spam emails, the way this guy's like copy and pasting them and send to a bunch of people. You know, he obviously thinks that I'm like, I'm, you know, Aryan and a skinhead like he is, you know. But, you know, one of the things that these people will say often when they comment is they're like, in Revelation chapter number one, when it tells you, and in Revelation 19, you said his eyes were as a flame of fire, they're like, you know, his eyes are as a flame of fire. And what is the hottest fire that burns? What color is it? It's blue. So they're like, he's white and he's got blue eyes. So he is like, he is completely like a white European. 100% Aryan blood, right? Jesus is an Aryan. That's really what these people think. I, I get comments like you wouldn't. I told Brother Russell that one night. I was like, I'm getting them like every three days. Literally like what? Two hours later on my way home, got another one. I think I sent it in the group text. Yeah. Sent it to everybody. Just constantly. People really buy this crap. That's why you have to look at both statements. It tells you, yeah, they were as a flame of fire, right? But then you go back to the prophecy about it and what is it? It says that his eyes shall be red with wine. So what, how are they like a flame of fire? They're red. They're not blue, my Aryan friend. You know, they're red. They're not blue. So you have to compare both scriptures. It's the same thing that the black, isn't this funny? The black Hebrew Israelites I just thought of this, do the same thing. They go to Daniel 9 where it says his hair is as the pure wool. And it's like, see, he's got woolly hair. They, but if you go to Revelation 1, it tells you how his hair is like pure wool. It's white as wool. Why do you think it says it's like pure wool? Do you think pure is like referring to the texture? Pure is clean. Saying that it's clean, it's white. That's what it's saying. When it talks about our robes when we get to heaven, they're pure and white. It's not saying that they're pure like the texture. Referring to the fact of what they're made of. It's talking about being white. Shows the importance of comparing scripture with scripture. And now you'll find a little nugget and a detail in one place that you won't find in the other. And you'll get a very specific detail, and then you can see the whole picture. But people that don't want it, they have like a preconceived idea, and they have these presuppositions because they're like already a racist, and they're trying to get the Bible because it has authority and power. They're trying to use the Bible to back up their agenda. They'll just pick the one that try to, they try to get to suit them. God often does this in the Bible where He gives you just enough in some passages 
to hang yourself with. He'll put enough there. That's why the Bible talks about Jesus Christ being you know, a, a stumbling stone or a stumbling block. What is Jesus? He's the Word of God. So this book oftentimes, there are things in here that'll get, that are just enough that are put there that if your heart's not right, it'll cause you to stumble. And you can see Jesus doing that when he's telling people things. They walk away thinking the wrong thing, like the rich young ruler, for an example. So there's just enough there if your heart's not right to, be, to, you know, to give you a stumbling block or to put a stumbling stone before you. Where did I have you turn? Isaiah 63. Isaiah chapter number 63. So I want, to know, I want to show you this too. This is very important because it actually proves, this prophecy proves the deity of Jesus Christ. Proves the deity of Jesus Christ because, you know, uh, um, Jews would look at, at Genesis 49 and they would say, hey, this is about the Messiah. They would say that, wouldn't they? This is about the Messiah, you know, of that line, the Messiah is going to come, of Judah. They have no explanation about why somebody's not reigning, I guess, right now. That'd be a major problem for them. And it says that there's not going to depart, you know, a lawgiver from between his feet. That's a major problem for them. But furthermore, they would say, hey, this, they would agree, hey, this is about the Messiah. This is a passage that is about the, you know, the Christ to come. Well, what's interesting, in the Old Testament as well, we have... Also, a parallel passage to that. But it's not specific. It doesn't specifically say, hey, this is about the Messiah or this is about the Christ. Look at Isaiah 63 1. It says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And then it says this, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Clearly the Lord speaking. You can show that from the latter context in this passage as well. Look at verse 2. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Notice that. How that is, of course, that's clearly a parallel of what we just saw. Look at verse number 3. I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people... There was none with me. So you could say, somebody could try to say, oh, well, Jesus is his agent. He's saying that because, you know, Jesus is being used as his agent. You know, if you had maybe had like some sort of person that is, uh, you know, believes in Arianism. But the problem is, he says, of the people, there was none with me. The Lord says he's by himself. Jehovah only is here. He says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled on my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. He specifically even says... There wasn't anybody that could help, so I had to do it all by myself, and there was no one else, and I'm completely alone. Like, he stresses, I'm by myself. Notice that when he does this, the exact description is given of the Messiah in the book of uh, Genesis, chapter number 49 that we just read. What does that teach you? That tells you that the Lord himself is going to be that seed that comes of the line of Judah. What do we find out when we get to the New Testament? Of course, we see that that is who it is. It's, of course, God manifest in the flesh. So this is a powerful passage, Genesis 49. Here, the prophecy that's given to uh, you know, uh, Judah, the tribe of Judah, that the, Lord, that the Messiah would be the Lord. And, of course, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number uh, 13 now. It says this, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for an haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zidon. Now that is a reference uh, to where they're located. They're located on the sea. And this could be related to end times, latter days. You know, that's talked about oftentimes, uh, them being on the sea and the destruction on the sea and how they're, you know, remember when Solomon's temple was flourishing and growing and, and, and they were in their glory days. It says that everything, all the riches were brought by sea. Wouldn't that make sense that Zebulun would be brought up here? It talks about him being on the sea and, and uh, his borders and, and the haven of ships. You know, haven is like a lot, right? So the haven of ships, that makes perfect sense if this is a reference to end times as well, the last days. Look at um, verse number 14. A lot of these, I, you know, I don't necessarily have anything for. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. That'd be like crouching again. Verse 15. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and bowed uh, uh, his shoulder to bear. And, uh, and became a servant unto tribute. Like, that's like taxes. 
Uh, verse 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. One of the only applications that I could come up with this was Samson is of the tribe of Dan. That's why I always think of when I think of the tribe of Dan in the first place. Because Dan isn't really talked about a lot. But one thing is Samson is a major character. Everybody likes Samson. Everybody talks about Samson. So one thing when I always think of the tribe of Dan automatically just, you know, Samson pops into my mind. What was Samson? He was one of the judges and it tells you there, Dan shall judge his people. So that could be a reference to Samson. I'm sure it is in one way or the other. Look at verse 17. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. So that's kind of just this parenthetic statement there. I'm not sure how that's related exactly. Verse number 19, it says this, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Now, <clears throat> does anybody remember what Gad means? It means a troop cometh, right? That's what they say. When they say Gad, it means a troop cometh. So notice how even his name is related to the prophecy that's given by Jacob. I pointed this out about Ephraim. Remember how it talks about over and over again about how Ephraim is going to be a blessing and how he's going to be fruitful and he's going to bring forth abundantly more than Manasseh? Well, that's what Ephraim's main name means as well. Remember how I tied that in last week? So sometimes even their names that were given to these men that were, that were going to be used providentially by God to be a nation or to be a tribe and a representative of mass people, God obviously would work through them, work through Joseph, giving him the name Ephraim because he, this would be fulfilled by him or by his you know, ancestors uh, later on. We see that with Gad here, obviously. Look at uh, verse number 20. <clears throat> Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Nephili is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. Uh, verse 22, we have something to work with here. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Now, a couple of things. Number one, we, we can see that very clearly the application to Joseph himself. Because remember, all these things that are you know, being passed down are passed down because of how that person lived in their life. And we see that this reflects Joseph's life. It's a description of Joseph's life. It talks about how you know, they, the, the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. Joseph spent his whole life, you know, a lot of his life being hated and being persecuted. His brethren, he's then thrown in jail. You know, uh, well, he's, he's, he, his brethren hate him. They end up throwing him, you know, or, or selling him into slavery. He gets there and then he's thrown in jail after that. And not only that, he has a lot of opposition, but he, he is still able to overcome this opposition. So even, even though, in spite of that, it says, verse number 24, but his bow abode, that means like stayed, even through all of this, in strength, and the arms of his hand were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. What does it tell you over and over again when Joseph is going through his persecutions? You know, each time. When he's sold into slave, slavery, it says, the Lord was with him. When he's in prison, what does it say? The Lord was with him. So notice that his hands were made strong by who? The mighty God of Jacob. Also, verse 22 you know, it tells you Joseph is a fruitful bow in a fruitful bow by a well. It says, who, or bow, I'm sorry, whose branches run over the wall. So, you know, the wall there could reflect also just like, like a hindrance. And he's running over the wall. It's like he's overcoming that, right? That's the same thing that verse 23 and 24 are explaining, how he's overcoming opposition when people are fighting against him. And that's interesting that it refers to archers because, you know, archers here, it's not referring to people with a sword because the archers would be like shooting over the wall, you can think of as well. But it's, it makes a reference to him being fruitful, right? Uh, turn to, while, while I'm explaining this, go to Psalm chapter number 1. It makes a reference to him being fruitful. And it talks about a tree and it says that he, that he is by a well. It says, even a fruitful bough by a well. So look at Psalm chapter number 1, a real famous psalm. A lot of you probably have memorized it. Psalm chapter number 1, look at verse number 1. What this is referring to, why it says he's by a well. 
you can see this, and this is actually, this Psalm chapter number 1 is a, actually shows up uh, in the book of Jeremiah as well. It says this in, uh, just look at verse number 3. It's, it's talking about the man that is blessed. Now, I don't believe that's a coincidence. It's talking about Joseph being blessed. It says this in verse 3, and he shall be like a tree, watch this, planted by the rivers of water. So notice a blessing that the tree is by the rivers of water. Where's the tree located? And, and, you know, uh, in Genesis 49, it's talking about Joseph. It's by a well. It's by waters. Why? Because a tree that has, you know, nutrition from waters, whether it be a river, whether it be a well, is able to yield more fruit, right? And that is the blessing that's being brought up. It's able to bring forth a lot of fruit. And that is referring to the blessing of his offspring because the reason why it's stressing how blessed that he is is because he's the one that's receiving that double portion through his children. So he is going to receive a massive blessing because now Ephraim and Manasseh, they're getting that double portion through because of Joseph. Uh, one thing I want to focus on, verse number 24. So go back to Genesis 49, verse number 24. I believe I have an answer for something that was kind of confusing. I spoke with some of you guys about this in verse number 24. You know, and this puzzled me for a real long time, super long time. Every time I'd read it, what is it talking about? Why does it say when it's talking about Joseph, does it say, from thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel? That's because it's not talking about Joseph. It's not referring back to Joseph. Look at verse number 24. But his bow, his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong. Now watch this. By the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And then it says this. From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. Now the shepherd of Israel is clearly Jesus. There's no way around that. You know, he's called, you know, uh, uh, it talks about the God of peace who raised, you know, uh, the great shepherd in Hebrews 13. You know, he's referred to as the shepherd and bishop of our souls. He calls himself the good shepherd in John 10. There's no way around that. The shepherd is Jesus, without a doubt. Jesus is also called what? A rock. He's also called a stone. He's called, you know, the chief cornerstone. This is a reference to Jesus. But did Jesus come from Joseph? No, it's not. I don't believe that that's what it's referring to. And I believe that's why this is in parentheses. I believe that's why, because this, this is meant to be. I believe the, you know, the King James, obviously it's not uh, uh, um, um, inspired. Parentheses punctuation is not inspired. But there still is an understanding of the reading. And in our language, it would make sense that this would be parenthetic, right? And it would be a statement that's referring back to not the subject, which is Joseph, but rather the object. So what is that? Right before it says it, that they were made, his hands were made strong, and it says, by, it says, the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And then it says, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So you have two options if you want to take this interpretation. You know, I, don't, I believe that it's impossible that it's referring to Joseph. You know, you could say that it's figurative, but... The, the shepherd, the, chief, the stone of Israel did not come from Joseph in any way. You could trace his line, his lineage. He didn't come from Joseph. It would make perfect sense that it's referring to one of two things. Number one, you could say this, and I'll tell you why I don't believe that this is right. You could say that it's referring to Jacob. But then you have it being quite redundant because it says, it would be, you would be saying, from, when it says from thence, you'd be saying from Jacob is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Well, of course... From Jacob, is, you know, it would it would be kind of funny to say that the from Jacob is the stone of Jacob. You could still say it, but it's it just you know it sounds. If you have another option, that kind of sounds redundant. Obviously, we know that the stone of Jacob or the stone of Israel is going to come from Jacob or Israel, right? Unless somebody try, you could you could try to you know formulate an argument that's kind of like well maybe. You know, uh, the stone of Israel, who actually like saved Israel, isn't from Israel, right? It's kind of, it becomes ridiculous at that point. I believe that it, this could be referring to, would make more sense, that it's referring to the mighty God of Israel. Because that's actually what it's talking about. The mighty God of Jacob. So it's the God of Jacob. So God is the one that's being emphasized there because he's the one that's strengthening Joseph. It's by his hands. And then you could say, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. That he's sent by God. I think that makes the most sense. And further proof of that is that it's, you know, the emphasis is on God is by the next statement. Verse 25. Even by, notice what's being restated, the God of thy father. So notice how that is restated. Even by the God of thy father. That that's the one that it's focusing on when it says that he's strengthened. You know, that his hands are being strengthened, right? 
Then it goes on and says, Who shall help thee? So notice God, the Father, right? And by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb. So those are two possible options of what it's referring to. It's that statement, the mighty God of Jacob. And Jacob, uh, it could be, you know, what it's referring to when it says, from thence is the shepherd. It could be just from the nation of Israel. Or it could be saying that from thence, talking about from God, that God is going to be the one that does it. God is going to be the one that sends him. Uh, either way. <clears throat> Notice the blessings again are referring to, you know, the offspring. Because it says specifically at the end of verse 25, it says uh, um, at the end, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. And of course it definitely is tying in with the land as well. It's, these are physical blessings because before that it talks about lieth under and the heaven above. Look at verse 26. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills. So he says, the blessings of thy father. Now he's speaking to the twelve tribes. He's speaking to his sons. You know, he's speaking to the twelve tribes through his sons. Because remember what it said in verse 28, all these are the twelve tribes of Israel. So he says, thy father. That's like speaking to the children of Joseph. And he says this, because remember, who's going to be reading this later on? You have to actually think about these things when you're reading, when you're going through this. Who's going to be reading this? The tribes of Israel are going to go through here and read this. And the tribe of Joseph would read this and it'd say, the blessings of thy father. Talking about Joseph. That's the one that's being blessed. The blessings, and in and, and verse number 25, what were those blessings to, given to? Joseph. Those were the blessings that were given to Joseph. And then he says in verse 26, the blessings of thy father. That's him re referencing the children of Joseph and saying the blessings of thy father, which is Joseph, have prevailed, watch this, above the blessings of my progenitors. Now, who's speaking? Jacob. Who are his progenitors? Abraham and Isaac. So it's saying that, that Joseph's blessings, the blessings that were bestowed upon his tribe, upon Joseph, were greater than the blessings that Abraham and Isaac received. That's, that's what it's teaching. It's saying that the blessings that Joseph and all of his offspring received were even greater than the, the blessings of Abraham and Isaac. And that's what a progenitor is. Progenitor is an ancestor, right? It's someone that... Uh, you know, pro is like, is like for. If someone's like pro-life, they're for something. It's like referring to something going forward. That's pro. And then genitor is like the word generator. It's like you're making something. Genealogy, right? It's something coming forward. That's what progenitor is someone that brings something forward. I'm the progenitor of Elijah and Jeremiah, right? So his progenitors, it's Abraham and Isaac. And he's saying that Joseph's blessings were even greater than Abraham and Isaac's blessings. Uh, keep reading there. It says, They shall be on the head of Joseph. So notice that he's not speaking to Joseph when he says, Thy father. He's speaking to his children. And he's speaking about Joseph's blessings. That's why he spoke of him in third person there. On the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. That is again about Joseph. Joseph was separate from his brethren. Of course, you know, he was uh, 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 exalted above his brethren in many ways. And he had the crown. He ruled over them in a way. And they bowed down to him. Look at verse 27. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey. And at night he shall divide the spoil. Now I want you to think about this. When you think of wolves being mentioned in the Bible, can you think of one positive? Even in an analogy or anything? Nothing. I thought about it and then I looked it up. Nothing. Not at all. The only time that they're ever mentioned and they're, and they're not negative ever is when it talks about, you know, the wolf shall lie with the lamb. Right? That's the only time. And then with the lion as well. You know, it's the only time that it's ever mentioned and there's never a positive. Lions are used in a positive way quite often. But wolves are never used in a, in a positive way. And I try to think of how you could use this. And, and, and think about this. How are wolves brought up every time in the Bible? When they are used in a negative way. They're always about like, you know, a, a predator. They're always about someone trying to hurt, stalking someone. You know, waiting in the background. You know, looking for an opportunity to do harm and to do damage. Talks about them being grievous, ravening, right? They're just hungry and looking for food every time. Right? So I thought of how could you apply that to Benjamin 
And the only thing that I could come up with that makes sense is Judges chapter number 19. Now those men are not specifically Benjamites, Benjaminites. They are from uh, Gibeon, but they live in the tribe. And they're technically a part of the tribe of Benjamin. They're mixed and mingled in there. You know, they are of Gibeon, but they're living in the tribe of Benjamin. And what were they? That's a perfect example of predators. That's a perfect example of... And we have another example of where Dan seems to be referring to the time of the judges, right? When it talks about, he shall judge his people. And that's Samson. That's within the, the, the 400 years that the judges uh, uh, ruled, right? So that would make sense if that's the only thing that I can even come up with. Um, the other things were kind of symbolic. You know, you could maybe say, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Benjamin in the sense of when it says, Benjamin shall raven as a, as a wolf in the morning, he shall devour the prey. And at night, he shall divide the spoil. All of that happened during the night as well in Judges chapter number 19, trying to tie that together. And how they're, you do, you know, uh, evil things in the night and stuff like that. So, look at verse number 28. <clears throat> All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is that that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Every one, according to his blessing, he blessed them. And he charged them, that's like a commandment, and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Mechpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And then it says this, And there I buried Leah. Uh, it's funny that, that Abraham or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jacob, you know, loved Rachel much, much more than Leah. You know, you remember Rachel, when she died, uh, they were traveling, and she ended up being buried in Bethlehem. And uh, he ended up burying Leah in that cave, or the field of Mechpelah, right, in the cave in Mamre. And he ends up, Jacob, when he's actually buried, ends up being buried next to Leah. Isn't that interesting? He says, There I buried Leah. Verse number 32, The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And of course, we read about that in the book of Genesis here. Verse number 33, And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, <coughs> excuse me, and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto, <coughs> excuse me, his people. Now, when it talks about him yielding up the ghost, that is a phrase that's used all the time about, you know, uh, death. Yielding up the ghost, this, it talks about uh, giving up the ghost or yielding up. That's what that means, to yield something means to give it up, to give up something, right? And this is the moment of death. Uh, when a person gives up the ghost, that's referring to their spirit, like the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Uh, you know, those are used interchangeable. So this is the moment when Jacob died. Notice it said he gathered up his feet into the bed. I mean, he's in bad condition. Like he's having to put, pick them up and put them together, basically. He's gathering his feet up into the bed. It makes it sound like he's, you know, he's struggling to even get back into the bed. And then it ends with, uh, at the very end, and was gathered unto his people. And I, I know Schofield, when I read his, when I started reading the Bible, and I remember his definition of it, and I've heard other people define it this way. When it talks about gathering unto his people, that people think that that's referring to the fact of where they're buried. Because oftentimes families are buried together. He made a reference to being buried with his family. And they think that that's referring to you know, where that person's physical body is going. He's gathered unto his people. But that's not so. And you can actually prove that. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned this before. But um, Moses died and was buried in the Mount of Nebo. Right? Who was Moses buried with and by? Any, any information? By God. By God. Was there anybody else there? Do you know what it says about Moses? He was gathered unto his people. It's not referring, you can eliminate for sure that that's not talking about his physical body. Do you know what that's talking about? He's gathered unto his people. It talks about, like, and I reference this, how Jesus Christ gathers into one those that are in heaven and those that are in earth. And it talks about the whole family, is of whom the whole family is named. The whole family, right? You know, it talks about how Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. We're all brethren. We're all part of one family. You know who our real people are? Are the people of God. 
You know, you should be spending time with your brethren is who you need to be spending time with. And not spending time with, you know, that should be our priority in life. It should be our brethren. It should be our church. It should be the people of God. Because when you die, you're going to be gathered together to your people. And then you're going to find out who your people really are. You're going to be gathered together with the people of God. With all of the children of God. And that's what really matters Amen. is that we all share Heavenly Father, right? The everlasting Father. You know, that is what matters. Is our, you know, that's what's most important in life. I mean, what, what stronger bond can you have with someone you know, than, than serving the same God, the same Creator, believing in the same Creator, serving the same you know, Savior, the one who saved us from burning in an eternal torment of hell? You know, what greater, you know, thing can you have in common with somebody else, right? I mean, you may have things in common about, you know, sports or, you know, whatever hobbies or interests with other people. But you, there is nothing greater that you can have in common with someone than actually being spiritual brethren. Man. Even, even blood brothers or blood sisters, whatever you want to refer to it as, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, depending upon your gender. You know, that, none of that... When it, when it comes down to it, none of that matters. Because if your brother is not saved and you are saved and you die, you're going to be gathered unto your people and that's not him or her. Your people are the people of God. That's what matters. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this chapter. It's just packed, filled with so much we can learn. Dear Lord, we thank you for uh, the word of God.